behalf of the Student Academic Success Program and also the first year experience body of work at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, I would like to, uh, to welcome any viewers to, to this, this uh, webcast. Uh, my name is Francisco Ojardo. I am a professor in the Department of Organization and School Leadership here at uh, UTRGV. And I am also the executive director of the B3 Institute. That is the institute that is uh, assisting in the transition of, of bilingualism, biliteracy, biculturalism, uh, and so as the way this university is transforming itself. And, and today I have the privilege of being in conversation with, with an old friend. And so I will not introduce him because he is very able to introduce himself. <laughs> Although I do know his first name, his middle name, and his last name. I even know where he grew up. Uh, but my, my guess, would you uh, do us a favor of introducing yourself? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yo soy de Agoberto Eli Ramirez. Y soy de Roma, right? I'm from Roma, Star County, Texas. And uh, Francisco and I have been friends and colleagues. And he was my mentor in my dissertation committee. Um, we met back in, must have been around 2000, 2001, when this university, their legacy school, was at that time Pan American University, and then soon to become UT Pan American. And so we've been in conversation about the topics I think we're going to talk about today for, I, for a long time. I am intrigued by, um, by the fact that you began by saying, yo soy. Yeah. Yo soy. Why would you do that? Well, I, I think one of the important things that I like to do here as a, I didn't introduce myself as what I do here, but I'm a lecturer in UNIV 1301. And so one of the important things I tell my students is, is that they got to get their story out. Who are you? Where are you from? How did you get here? On whose shoulders did you stand? And I tell nobody does it alone, right? And so all of us uh, stand on the shoulders of others. So I always think of Yo Soy, uh, where I'm from. And to me, the biggest, one of the biggest deals is the fact that I am from nearby, right? From Star County, from Roma. And so I think back on those years in the 60s, growing up as a young child, and then having the dream of coming to this university at the time. Uh, I didn't come here first. I, I ended up going much further north, but that's another story. Pero por eso el, es tan importante para mí el yo soy. Mm -hmm. I am. Mm. Who I am and also where I'm from. Muy importante. When, uh, when I was a, a child growing up here in the valley, I grew up in, in the neighboring town of Elsa, went to Ed Couch also schools. Um, you know, we, we grow up there. We grow up in the valley. In, in certain ways that are defined by, by a certain set of cultural practices and you know, characteristics. And one of those is, is how we are able to use multiple languages. Mm -hmm. And so that we may use English and then we slip into Spanish and then we go back into English and there's a good amount of code switching and in the literature now they call it translanguaging. Mm -hmm. And so there's a good amount of of, uh, of nimbleness with that. And so growing up here with that kind of language use, uh, I, I also found that to be almost like the province of what we do in the neighborhood. Perhaps what we do in informal spaces. And so that yo soy, I actually grew up with that being only as part of this informal discourse. Mm -hmm. I didn't see that being part of the formal no. discourse. No, and, and here lately I actually read an article, a, a peer-reviewed journal article within the last, last half year that talks about the complexity of translanguaging. Because they used to put us down, por hablar inglés, español, mixing it, pocho, right? And it actually turns out that being able to code switch, being able to translanguage, is much more complex than to speak only in English or speak only Spanish. So for years, for centuries, we've been doing a, a very complex thing when they were trying to put us down, that we were less smart, less agile with our language. We were much more agile than monolinguists, you know. Not to put them down, 
but hey, let's let's put it in context. You know, the the, the stuff we've been doing in translanguaging has been a very complex issue. And, and so this complexity. Mm -hmm. When was it that you first thought, hey, that this is complex? Did you grow up thinking, hey, what I'm doing now is actually pretty complex stuff? Not really, not really. Um, I would. I was probably in my mid-twenties when I ventured into uh, songwriting with my cousins. And so we would write l songs in English, songs in Spanish, Los Rojos de Roma, right? And um, the, los, For the record, Los Rojos de Roma <laughs> uh, w was a band? It was a band, but yes. it, it was a band that uh, only played at, at, at friends' houses and at pachangas and things like that, you know? Okay. And so it was a lot of fun, but we, I, would, I was a lyricist, right? So I would write in English. I write in Spanish, and then we started writing in English and in Spanish. And so, but even then I wasn't cognizant, like, oh, this is what I'm doing is very complex. And I wasn't until I read that article, like, four or five months ago, that I recognized, oh, my God, uh, this hunch that I had that this was an important, cool thing actually has academic, scholarly validity to it, you know, the translanguaging. Uh, when, uh, when I graduated from... Uh from college, I went to the University of Texas at Austin. I graduated in 1987 and went straight into graduate school. And in graduate school, I took a course with this scholar. He was already a leading scholar. His name is Ramon Saldivar. Mm. And he was in the English department at UT. I was doing a graduate program in history. But I took this course because Ramon Saldivar, who is from Brownsville uh, uh, and was a professor at UT at Austin at the time. and he had developed a course entitled Chicano Narrative. And one of the textbooks that he assigned was a textbook by a woman named Gloria Ansaldúa entitled Borderlands, the New Mestiza. It was hot off the press. And when I read Ansaldúa, I realized a number of things. Number one, she was from Edinburgh. She had grown in Hargill, grown up in Hargill. Mm -hmm. She had come to Pan American. And as I went through on Saludos chapter one. You know how she wrote? Yo soy de aquí. Oh. She wrote um, the dialectics of whatever, whatever, pero eso no me gusta porque esto, I mean, not those words, right? But she switched in and out. And I thought, what? This is the way I grew up. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I am being now asked to read how I spoke on Third Street in Elsa con los compañeros del barrio the way we would, you know, interact. Mm -hmm. This person was writing it in this book, and I was uh, taken aback. I didn't think this is cheap. I thought, oh, wow, this is my voice. Mm -hmm. So she came here, it must have been when, in the 70s? 66, oh. 60... Yeah. She, when she graduated from Edinburgh High School in 1962, I think, she went to Texas Women's University, was there for a bit. Then something happened. She came back home. Mm -hmm. Then she would enroll at what was at the time Pan American College. In her book, Chapter 5, when the How to Tame a Wild Tongue, she actually says Pan American University. But she wrote that in the 80s. And I don't think she was clear about whether it had gone from college to university. And I don't think it did until a few years later. But, you know, she wrote the experience of coming to Pan Am and being subjected to the speech test. Mm -hmm. And when she spoke with an accident, she was dispatched to remediation, mm -hmm. where she would take two courses in speech to purportedly, in her words, to tame her wild tongue. Nobody tamed Ricardo Montalban's tongue, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Or Anthony Quinn's. Or Anthony Quinn. It's amazing. Or, or, or Rita Hayward's. And también. But, but, okay, but no, no, but why would they not? <laughs> why, why would they, yeah. whoever the they is, <clears throat> yeah. the powers of why you. would they tame Gloria Saldúa's wild tongue mm -hmm. and not Ricardo Montalban's yeah. wild tongue? Uh, maybe that wasn't a wild tongue. Uh, it probably had to do with uh, genderism, sexism, a brown, you know, a brown woman, uh, I think, you know. Mm. Back in the day, mm. Mm. Well, I'm curious, and I want you to, to drive your conversation now into what this place was called back in the day. Mm -hmm. When when I had this dream of coming here, or an expectation of coming here, but a scholarship led me for much further north, 
um, for a few years, but then I came back and finished here. But I remember back in the 80s when I came back here to finish. But hang on, this is really good coffee. I just wanted to make that observation. Okay. Well, let me take a sip too. I, I, I preparan cafe bueno aquí en, en UTRGV. Y hay tacos también because this is tacos. Ta taco talk. <laughs> so, but, okay, yes. you know, this university was a dream factory, has been a dream factory for, mm. for thousands of students. Where'd you get that dream factory? It is. Where'd you get it? I don't know. Did I borrow it somewhere? Yes. From who? From I don't you? Know. No, not from am me. Am I quoting you? Without no, 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 no. I, I, <laughs> I did not coin that. But, but I'm curious. Who yeah. came up with Dream Factory? I don't know. And how, I do you, how do you put Dream Factory <laughs> next to Taco Tech? Exactly. That's Can what those I want to talk about. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> no, no. That's what I want to ask you about, what you remember. Mm. You know, I mean, I think that it was used in an attempt to be derogatory towards our school. Uh, here in the valley, which is Pan American University, f formerly Pan American College, and then soon to be UT Pan Am, and now here we are UTRGV. But back in the 80s, I clearly recall my colleagues in France calling this place Taco Tech. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, we laughed it off, you know, just brushing it off, but I think there, there were certain segments around the state further north possibly or maybe even people within here of uh, different from us that looked at this place as less than and so they, they attempted to to label it in a way that would make fun uh, be derogatory like I said I mean mm. did, did you ever get a sense of that did you hear that oh yeah up? yeah no, no I, I think it's it's one of the reasons that I didn't want to come to this school Wow. As an 18-year-old who was a good student at Ed Calchosa High School, I think that we didn't want to come to this place because it was known as Taco Tech. And so put that reality mm -hmm. next to the reality that my brother, Juan, had graduated from Ed Calchosa High School in 1978 mm -hmm. at the top of his class and went to Pan Am. And so my brother told this story several times, and I remember it when I was very young, that when he went into freshman English at Pan Am, the professor went down the row, I don't know if it was first day or when, but asked everybody where they were from. Good pedagogy. Sure. And when my brother came up, he said, my name is, and I'm from Ed Calchosa. And the story my brother remembers was that the professor then asked him, Ed Couch also, do you know how to read? Really? My brother shared that story. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, my brother came to Pan Am. And it was, it was a, a place that was very important. But for young idealistic kids, it was in the air that this was... And so then we would make sense of what that meant. What did it mean? Well, we would make sense of it. We didn't want to go there. Mm. You know, I, however we made sense of it. And, and I think part of why, and I don't know who came up with that. Right. Taco Tech. I don't know who came up with Dream Factory. <laughs> but I, I, I think that what happened was that, <clears throat> I mean, it's a complex situation, right? Because it has to do with economic imperatives. I think it has to do with survival of an institution. I think it has to do with demographic shifts. I think it has to do with, you know, sort of the development of a region, the economic and sort of community emergence of a region. But was it also an attempt at otherizing us? You know, like we're the oh, other... Oh, yeah, no, I think so. so I think... Son diferentes, no son nosotros. Yeah. They're otherizing way, they're way us. down there on the bottom of Texas. They're, they're in Mexico, practically. Or we otherizing ourselves. So I think this is what begins to happen. I think that, that, that what happened was the, the multitude of the wild tongues inhabiting this place. Mm. This place would not have survived just by sheer demographic analysis had this place not opened its doors to more Mexican-American students. Because you cannot economically, feasibly keep 
the engine running if you don't have people paying tuition. And it just so happened that the, the demographic reality was that there was a browning of the Rio Grande Valley, mm -hmm. precipitously so, in the second half of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my, my observation of this and my even study of this, because I've gone through certain archives, like, you know, I went through the archive of, of, of a very interesting, it's a, it's a thin archive, but it's a very interesting archive of, of Emilia Chunior. Mm -hmm. We have a building named after Emilia Chunior. Ramirez. Emilia Chunior Ramirez. Emilia Chunior was, you know, a graduate of 1919's Edinburgh High School class. She was one of two graduates. She, she came to this school, you know, when it was a, a junior college. Then she would graduate from somewhere else. I don't remember where, maybe Texas Women's. And, yeah, and then she would go get a master's degree from UT at Austin. And she was on the faculty here of the Spanish department in the 1950s. And e Emilia Chuy Ramirez was pushing the instruction of language, Spanish language, at this place. During the time that this, this college was beginning to see a shift in the demography, going from majority white to majority brown. And as that happened, they upped their game in hiring speech teachers in the speech department. So when Ansaldúa enrolls in this place some 10, 15 years later, mm -hmm. the practice was in full swing to do remediation, speech remediation. Mm -hmm. It's almost like <clears throat> leave your language outside the door, leave your culture outside the door, and now here you are the B3 director. Right, but and there's... It's amazing, like yeah, it half is. a so, century I mean, later. <laughs> we, are, we are turning history on its head institutionally, right? Yeah. But so what happens in the 60s and 70s is that we get more and more Mexican American students come into the university, and and you know most of them I don't know ninety plus percent are first generation. Many of them translanguaging, many of them code switching, many of them coming to this university and shaping the university culturally in very different ways. They're speaking Spanish on campus, and then to add to that, you have the the civil rights movement having an impact on the Chicano movement, and you have Mayo, Mexican American Youth Organization. You have the student walkout in Ecauchosa that really, you know, does something to impact this university in the 70s. Mm -hmm. You have the far riots, you have stuff that is going on in far, and then you have the United Farm Workers and the emergence of that. And, and a lot of that is being incubated as well at this university. This university is becoming very Mexicanized in the 70s. Mm -hmm. How do you brand that? How do you brand that when you only have iconography that is sort of like short list iconography? And one of those icons is the taco. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be a nice acronym for something it's, powerful it, and different. It's good branding. Today. It, it is. Taco Tech? Oh, Taco Tech today, would, would, I'd love for us to, to turn it on its head and, and de develop an acronym. And I, I think one of our colleagues has developed an, an acronym for it. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. What, do you know what the acronym is offhand? I think, it, I think it's something like Teaching, Academia, Conocimiento, and Outreach. Imagine that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Taco. So, uh, maybe it could be translanguaging yeah. instead of teaching. Yeah. Well, I think that the acronym <laughs> speaks to a number of different things at so many different levels. You know, I think it, it speaks to how I think there are people at this university who are trying to, number one, reinvent themselves as they are also trying to reinvent what it is that we're doing. And I think the reinvention, the reimagination mm -hmm. of who we are, which I think is not only a noble thing, but a very useful thing that has utility. Because I don't think that we want an 18-year-old kid, a 17-year-old kid who's really bright, you know, and is about to graduate from high school, say, I don't want to go to that place. Because the fact is that this is a good place. The fact is that it was a good place. It was, yeah. It, it was. Still is. But, but there was a perception because of, I think, because of symbols, because mm -hmm. of, you know, the use of language, mm -hmm. because of stereotypes even. Yeah. And, and so, you know, that can be created by people who create them intentionally or unintentionally. They just, you know, and then, mm -hmm. but if it's sexy, you know, if it's yeah. sexy, then it will reproduce itself. Yeah. I think the iconography mm. has turned in its head already. I mean, mm. we know that uh, us as taco eaters and beaners, I mean, uh, 30, 40 years later, 
um, the whole world wants to eat tacos. They, the they all want to eat tacos. They, they want, want to eat fajitas. Beans and refried beans. Fajitas and, and chiladas. So you think that maybe we call it Taco Tech people and say, hey, I want to go there? I want to go there. <laughs> you think so? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we, I think we have a couple of minutes to wrap up. So what would you like to say now to wrap up? I think you should have a swig of coffee before we do. I, I would like to say that we can actually think in terms of student academic success yeah. as, as a process that students go through where they know these stories, where they mm. know who they are, where they know yo history soy. and context and what? Yo soy. Yo soy. Yo soy. Yeah. Yo this soy is, Taco Tech. And actually, you know, the, the great epic poem of the Chicano movement was, as you know, Yo soy Joaquin. Yo soy Joaquin. Right? By Corky Rodolfo Cor Corky Gonzalez. Gonzalez. Yo soy. This is why, I don't know if you intended to or not, but you used words that are very emblematic, you know, and very, I think, uh, historical even. Did you do that on purpose? Well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm so inspired by my dissertation chair that, you know, you just... Shirley Mills inspired. No. <laughs> I was not your dissertation chair. No, I chair. know, but you were there in my committee. You, I, might, okay. you might as well have been. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I mean, I, I would say that uh, we've come a long way. We've got a long way to go because I think that this university will really um, arrived. This university will have arrived when we are able to fix the issues of drainage in our community, when we're able to fix issues of health care in our community, when we're able to fix issues of literacy in our community, and where we can perpetuate in a big way the idea that this is a dream factory. That's when we will have emerged as a university that is, you know, consequential and important to the community. Takota can emerge when we can really, you know, celebrate ourselves and deal with those issues that I think people really care about. And then we can say, yo soy Takota. I think so. Dagoberto Ramirez, el Dr. Ramirez, thank you very much for, for joining me in this conversation. <laughs>